If you remember Psalm 1, it gives a picture of the blessed man. Some of you may have got this hidden in your heart. He is like a tree, the blessed man. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. But if not read in light of the whole counsel of God, it might leave you thinking, Psalm 1 might leave you thinking that the Christian life is always a walk in the park. This is where Psalm 25 comes in. It teaches us that the righteous path is sometimes a hard path. And this is where we find David in Psalm 25. While we, we can't be sure of his exact circumstances, he's deeply struggling to follow the Lord. And he's struggling because he's allowed several obstacles, several external and internal conflicts that are keeping him from a joyful and confident pursuit of God. And there are four of them. There's fear. He's got fear of his enemies, confusion over the path to take, guilt over present and past sins. And on top of that, he's a lonely man. There doesn't seem like anybody can help. And all of these things are like weights. They're like burdens that are preventing him from moving forward in the Christian life. And now I think all of this is very important because all believers go through times when they struggle in some fashion like that, that they struggle with these internal and external conflicts and they can wreak havoc on our spiritual life. And guys, brothers and sisters, the good news of Psalm 25, as we will see shortly, is that despite our many struggles, God is faithful to counsel, lead, and guide us. I love how John Piper sums this up. The Christ of the Bible is not only our atoning Savior, but our authoritative advisor. So with those thoughts, let's stand and read. I'm going to read the whole text. So if you've got wobbly knees then you may want to stay seated um, as we read these, this passage. So Psalm 25, David begins with, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God out of all his troubles. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, teach us your ways today. Help us learn how to navigate this Christian life your way. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated.
So the way God leads David through all of this is not like a straight line, but a fall corn maze. Ever been on one of those fall corn mazes? Uh, I remember a particular time I got in one and I walked in circles and I felt like I would never find the way out. And this is kind of like David's experience in Psalm 25. He repeatedly circles back to some of the same struggles. So as we go through the text this morning, I'm going to bounce around a bit. But the first thing David does is pray. He bows in prayer. Look at verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. I've heard it said that when the outlook is bleak, try the uplook. I like that. When the, when the narrow road gets hard and you're confronted with fear and confusion and you feel like nobody can help, believers always have the blood-bought privilege of lifting their souls to heaven. Hebrews 4.16 reminds us of that. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Quote, prayer is not merely the words we say, but the movement of the soul toward God. Prayer is coming into communion with the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. <laughs> oh, my friends, that's the first thing we must do when we're in need of guidance, when we're deep in the valley in need of help, we must come into the presence of the Lord for in his presence is not only fullness of joy, but everything we need to live the Christian life. And one of the reasons David is unsettled is because he has enemies. He has enemies who are trying to push him out from trusting God. Look at verse 2. He says, oh my God, in you I trust let me, let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. And then like the fall corn maze in verse 19, he repeats it again. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. So David knew what it was like to be surrounded by enemies. You got Goliath history. You got Philistines. You got King Saul. You got temptations. He knew all of this struggle. And he's being a little honest. And I like honesty. He's a little fearful that if God does not help, if God does not show up, if he does not guide him through this, David will feel disappointed and abandoned by God. And this is nothing but old-fashioned fear. And at times, if we're honest, it's a struggle for all of us. And it shows itself in what I call the what-if questions of the Christian life. Have you ever asked any what-if questions like this? What if God calls me to something that's just too hard, just too difficult for me to do? Or what if I make a leap of faith and I fall flat on my face? Ever had thoughts like that? Or this one. What if in my everyday struggle with sin, God gives up on me and abandons me? Ever thought about that one? These are all thoughts that at times, if we're honest, we struggle with, and, but they revolve around one question. It's this, do you really trust God? Do you really trust God? And in verse 3, after David wrestles for that a minute, God spirals him out and he says, indeed, what am I thinking? Focus here on, 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 on God. Indeed, none who wait for you, O oh God, will be put to shame. Instead, they shall be shamed who are wantonly treacherous. To be wantonly treacherous, we don't talk like that very much, but it means this. It means to reject the Lord as a trustworthy God and to go your own way. It means to reject the Lord as a trustworthy God that he is and try to handle life your way. But David is saying this. He's saying this. It's not those who trust 
Christ who will be shamed? It's those who rebel and do not trust God. And I always think about Matthew 7. I think Matthew 7 at the bottom of that chapter, it just says it very clear. He's, Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be wantonly foolish or wantonly treacherous. They'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. In other words, it's a wise and right thing to trust the Lord. Now, David goes a little deeper into what that looks like. And he's not just imagining. This isn't like Santa Claus religion. I imagine that God is trustworthy. It's not what he's doing here. He's got a basis for his trust. Look at verse 5. And on one level, it's, it's experiential. Look at verse 5. He says, he says, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. That's experiential. David, he, he, his basis for God's trust on one level is based on his experience. He's experienced a mighty deliverance from sin. And here's what God is registering in his heart. If God can be trusted to deal with my sin, God can be trusted to deal with my life. I think about Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God is trustworthy. And then on another level of David's trust is the basis of God's covenant faithfulness. Look at verse 6. Look at his, he says, remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old, from of old, it's ancient. So the basis for David is this, he's looking back in scripture and he can clearly see that God fulfills his promises. His character is faithful, he's true, he's trustworthy. In other words, sometimes how we deal with the present and our circumstances is remember the past. From of old, the Bible reveals God's perfect character and that he has never broken a single promise. And brothers and sisters, it's this unwavering trust in God that takes that element of fear and panic out of difficult situations. Amen on that. It's that unwavering trust in God that takes away fear. Look at verse 13. I'm going to skip way down there. Look how David says this. He says, his soul, in other words, the man who trusts in the Lord shall abide in well-being and his offspring shall inherit the land. That just means this. The man who trusts the Lord will dwell at ease. Anybody follow Anthony Brunson? On TV, the, the pastor who was arrested and recent release, recently released, um, CBS News did an interview this week. And, you know, you, you got CBS News and you got this Christian pastor and they're just probing a little bit. And one of the questions they asked him was, how did you remain sane and persevere through that difficulty? And one thing he said, it just grabbed me in, in, in light of this sermon. He said, in the face of fear, it was truth that got me through. You see, his wife kept feeding him truth about the covenant faithfulness of God. And that's what kept him sane and at peace. So recap, the first thing we must do when we're tempted to doubt that God is trustworthy and fear comes over us, we're to remember that God is trustworthy. And I've never heard of anybody, I've never heard of anybody who gave it up all for the sake of Christ to come away feeling abandoned by God. You never will. He is faithful. And know this too. I'm learning this too. <laughs> 
The more you trust God, the more trustworthy you'll find him to be. You write that down in your Bible. The more you trust God, the more trustworthy you will find him to be. Now, let's move to the second point. David's got another conflict. So fear, check. Now he's got confusion. That's another one wrestling with him. It's not unusual in the face of fear and trouble to lose your bearings and find yourself in need of advice and guidance. But look what David does in verse 4 and 5. He doesn't, he doesn't do what some people do. He doesn't go to worldly wisdom. He goes to God. Look, verse 4. Make me to know your ways, O God. Make me to know your ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Now, all of this, when we're seeking guidance, we've got to remember something. When we're seeking guidance and help, it's all centered around God's word. So remember, Scripture teaches we have all we need for what? We have all we need for life and godliness. Now, there are several principles here that must be true of us if we're going to seek guidance in God's word. And the first, it's not in your notes, but just feel this for a second. Just feel this. This David's deep dependency here. Look, make me. Teach me. Lead me. David realizes something about himself. God, if you don't teach me, I'm not going to learn this. If you don't compel me, I'm not going to learn this, oh God. You make me, teach me, lead me. And folks, sometimes we forget just that foundational principle. When we're faced with trouble and and, and whatnot, we just need to be brought back to the fact we need God. Now, there's three principles here that I'm going to lay out for you. Verse 4. He says, make me to know your ways. That's commitment talk. Make me to know your ways. When seeking guidance, we must be committed to obeying God's word. Let me give you a little, I'm going to step on your toe for a minute. Um, Have you ever asked someone to do something for you? And they said, well, it it depends on what it is. What, what What they are really saying in that moment, I've thought about this, is, They have a qualified willingness, a qualified commitment. I'll do blank as long as it doesn't involve blank. And sadly, this is what many do when they seek God's help and guidance. Lord, make me to know your ways, but don't send me to Africa. Or Lord, teach me your paths, but make sure they're easy. Make sure I still got enough time to watch TV at night or whatever I do. Make sure it's easy. And some of us giggle on that, but that's a deep-rooted problem for many of us. Before we can obey God, we must first be committed to his word. Second, we must be taught God's word. David says, teach me your paths, O God. Teach me your paths. So simply put, God, God, we have to have a teachable spirit about us. To go God's way, we must say in our hearts, my way is wrong, your way is right, teach me, O God. And it's this teachable spirit that's absolutely necessary to be guided by God. Now think about your life for a minute. When you're faced with trouble, here's how one way you'll know who's your teacher. And if you're teachable, when you're faced with trouble, when's the last time you've got down on your knees in your secret quiet place with your Bible and let God counsel you and teach you? That convicted me this week. When when, when I'm in trouble, where do I go? Do I just deal with it? Or do I get in God's word and let him counsel me? And I'm afraid of this, that some of us, rely too much on our teachers and not the teacher. That a lot of our problems, I'm convinced of this, I'm convinced of this, that a lot of our problems on a day-to-day basis could be solved if we would just get in God's word and allow him to counsel us and teach us. Now, lastly, third there, we must be led by God's word. We must be committed, 
We must be teachable and we must be led. Lead me, David says, lead me in your truth. So as a pastor, I often have people come seeking some biblical principles for their marriages, for their jobs, for their difficulties, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But when you lead them down the biblical path, I often find this, they're hesitant or even reluctant to obey it. I often hear this, <clears throat> well, let me think about it or let me wait for God to speak to me. Anybody ever heard that before? Let me go. Let me, let me take your biblical counsel on me and let me wait for God to speak to me. And listen, listen to me. We are not to seek extra biblical signs to validate what God has already clearly said. We are not to seek extra biblical signs to validate what clearly God has already said in his word. I call it horoscope Christianity. Some, when you need guidance and counsel, you're more about signs and feelings than you are the scriptures. I write this in my Bible too. I wrote this on guidance passages. We don't need voices when we have verses. We don't need voices when we have verses. We must take God at his word, trust him even when it's hard, and act. That's called humility. That's called trusting, being teachable. And lastly, guys, we see a lot through here about waiting. Look, look at verse 5. For you I wait. For you I wait all the day long. And, and David mentioned this waiting and guiding thing. And, and repeatedly, look, look at verse 3. He says, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. In verse 21, may integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. So waiting and guidance and help go hand in hand. Now, let me, let me give you a Bible story illustration. Um, remember when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. Remember the Exodus and remember when they got to the Red Sea and they became trapped by Pharaoh's army. Remember that. And they were filled with fear and confusion. Remember that? They're right there. They're like, God, you've you brought us this far, and now you just stopped us right here at this ocean, and here comes this army. Now imagine the fear and the confusion that probably came up in their spirits and hearts. And I love, I love what Moses says to him. Moses, you know, Moses says to him, he says, the Lord will fight for you. All you got to do is be silent and still. I love that. You imagine telling those people that, you know, the Lord will fight for you. Just be silent and still. And I think we can apply that here, that sometimes God brings us to difficult situations just to make it clear to us that we need him. And sometimes he allows us to wait and linger in those things to remind us that we are weak and he is strong. That's happened to me repeatedly. I've been in those situations. You're all discombobulated. It feels like a season of the, of the valley. And God's just letting you sit there and simmer in it just to show you you're weak. You need me. And in those times, you, you uh, get a special renewal. We're going to get to that in a second. So let's transition. So we got, we've got David struggle with what? He struggled with... Uh, Fear, then he struggled with confusion, and now he gets into another interesting little dilemma. He's got guilt on his hands. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. So this, this sin, sin, guilt talk is woven throughout. Look at verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. And then verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Then verse 18, consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. So on top of fear and confusion, he, he, this guilt is compounding things. There's, there's sin in his life, and it's weighing heavy on David. Look at verse 16. 
David is real honest here. He says, God, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. This guilt and this, this is bothering me. And the troubles of my heart are really enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Now, there's two things I want to say here in line with this guilt that David's dealing with. Number one is this. It's wise. It's wise in every season of trouble to search our hearts and our lives for sins or acts of carelessness that might account for the situation that we're in. While I'm not saying that all trouble is a result of sin. I'm not saying that, but it can be. For example, if we've committed a sin that we know God wants us to abandon, to give up, we can grieve the fellowship of God. Ephesians 4.30 is clear on that. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And just to make I sure I'm doctrinally clear here, sin cannot make you lose your salvation, but sin can make you lose your direction and make you confused about God's purposes and will for your life. But the good news is this, 1 John 1, 9, is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And I've found this in my life. When I've messed up, tripped up, and I've come to 1 John 1, 9, I receive clarity and direction again of what God's purpose and will is. Guilt can cloud our minds about what God has called us clearly to do. Second thing I want to say about this. With growth in grace, sanctification, as we grow in grace, oftentimes it it is accompanied by a heightened sensitivity to your own sinfulness. (laughs) As you grow closer to Jesus, the more dirt you see in your life sometimes. (laughs) Amen on that? You know, I find that it's like, man, it's like, I'm sinful. You know, it's like the closer that you get to the light, the more, you know, imperfections you see. And, and for David, look at verse 7. This, the way this registers with David is he says, Remember not the sins of my youth. The other day I was talking to a dear brother in the faith who was struggling, was struggling deeply with shame and guilt. This is a believer, by the way. A believer who was struggling deeply over the sins of his youth. This guy was 60, 65 years old and talk about sins committed when he was 25, 30. And it just hit him one day as he's growing in grace. It just hit him like a ton of bricks. How could I live that way when I was was young like that? How could I have made those choices? How could I have allowed myself to get into that? And, and, And the guilt was just registering real, real for him. That's happened, maybe it's happened to you. Old sins can bring new guilt. And this is why we must be vigilant with the gospel because Satan is the accuser of the brethren and he loves to bring new guilt over old past forgiven sins. We gotta be vigilant with the gospel and we gotta remember on a day-to-day basis You can find yourself wrestling with these things and not even know you're really wrestling with these things. And the remedy is the gospel that we got to apply it. Remember, Jesus paid it all, friends. He paid it all. Sin left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Amen? As you get older, you young folks, you young ducks in here, if there is any young ducks in here, I don't know if there's any here or not, but, you know, I'm 41, and I'm remembering my past, and I've got an ugly past, and God, Satan wants to look at how bad you used to be. He wants you to wrestle in that and, and, and feel discouraged, and here's what he'll do. 
If you allow that to simmer in your brain, it'll mess with your conscience and it'll start pulling you away from God. I'm not, man, I'm not good enough to do this. I struggled too much. I got a bad past. You be careful with those things. Satan loves to mess with people like that. So I'll just be blunt and move on to the last point. And you think about this, but listen, if you're in need of guidance today, you're needing help, you're confused, and you're troubled, listen to me. Sometimes on the quest for guidance, the remedy is very simple. You just need forgiveness. Sometimes on the quest for guidance, you don't need information. You just need forgiveness. You need repentance. That's what you need. And I think in some sense, guys, in this passage, that this is what's happened to David that he's been struggling with so much confusion and fear and guilt that he's even felt lonely and distant from God. But in his waiting and in his praying and in his seeking, the good God has counseled him and applied to his heart what he really needs. You know what that is? The gospel. He needs to be reminded of the covenant love of God. And look at verse 14. I think this is a good place to just kind of sum it all up. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes them to know, or he makes known to them his covenant. In other words, the friendship, the help, the counsel, the guidance, what we need is for those who find refuge in Christ. It's for those that, that know they are weak sinners in need of much forgiveness and counsel and guidance and strength and grace on a day-to-day basis. And it is those who are poor in spirit who God richly blesses with his covenant love. They can come and confide in him. And here's what he makes known to them. For the poor in spirit, for those who find refuge in Christ, here's what he makes known to them. That through faith in Christ's life, death, and resurrection, sinners, sinners, sinners can come to know the eternal friendship of God. In Christ, God is the friend of sinners. Amen on that. And last thing I want to look at verse 22. For those of you who are thinking, man, David's got it pretty bad. I ain't got it this bad. Or maybe you're sitting out, out there thinking, I don't, I don't struggle like this guy does. Look at verse 22. Redeem Israel, the whole church. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. The struggle of David is the struggle of all God's people. We all go through things like this. We're all susceptible to fear, confusion, guilt, and loneliness. We're all in need of reminding ourselves of the gospel and that God is a friend and counselor of sinners. So what this morning? Are you trusting the Lord as your sin-forgiving Savior and authoritative guide? So when, when, when you're faced with the conflicts of David that often accompany the Christian life, are you looking to Jesus and the gospel? Are you looking to the gospel for comfort and encouragement and help? Closing story. This is, this is pitched to the unbeliever here. So I met a non-Christian a few weeks ago, a non-Christian a few weeks ago who was deeply struggled with these four things. He was confused about the direction he should take. He was guilty over the sins he'd been committing. He was fearful over what might happen to him. And he was lonely. And he said as he was driving down Garrison Boulevard, he said he became so overwhelmed with despair that he pulled over to the side of the road and got his iPhone out and he started scrolling through all 350 of his iPhone contacts looking for one person who could offer the counsel that he needed. And as he was scrolling through those 350 contacts, he sunk down in his seat 
And he could not believe after all the years of his life he has not accumulated one person who could offer anything to help him. So guess what he did? He pulled over out here on Garrison Boulevard. True story. He walks up to Parkwood Baptist Church. And long story short, me and him went and got coffee. And long story short, I took him to Psalm 25. <laughs> you know, it's funny how God works and all this stuff. And uh, I explained the gospel to him. Now, he hasn't converted yet. He hasn't converted yet, but it's really made him think. Is God a friend of sinners? It's really made him think. Or maybe that's here you today. You're like, man, I, I know I hear all this, but I, God's a friend of sinners. He counsels sinners. And I'm here to tell you, he does. You're looking at one. <laughs> You're looking at one who's been counseled, led, and guided by God and forgiven by God. That's the good news of the gospel. God befriends sinners. So if you are lost and without hope today, come to the gospel and experience the covenant love of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. We thank you for the simplicity of your word and how it handles the complexity of our inner struggles. We thank you, Lord God, that you are our counselor and you are our advisor, our guide, and our savior. We thank you for that. Where would we be if not for your word and how it instructs us and leads us and guides us? So, God, apply that to our hearts today in a rich way that if anyone in this room is perplexed today, that they may be led along the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Comfort them, O oh God. In your name we pray. Amen.